multi-factor authentication. Now, that's something that's gaining popularity and, well, everyone says it's really important for our security. But what does that really mean? What does that really do for us that, you know, a traditional login method like username and password does not do? Now, I know I've talked about this in the past before, but that was sort of at quite a limited level. So today, we're going to delve further. We're going to take a closer look at what multi-factor authentication really means and how it's useful to us. So yeah, without further ado, let's jump into our random Wednesday episode. Hello and welcome back to another random Wednesday episode. Now, first of all, what is multi-factor authentication? You've probably seen this before. You know, when you're logging into certain sites, you get a message on your phone. On that message, there is this code which you then key in and that is sort of part of the login process to confirm it's you. In certain cases, you may even have to generate a code, you know, using your mobile phone or even a dongle like this one. So the thing is, well, we get the idea that sort of we are authenticating in a different way, but how does that help us? To better understand this, we're going to have to delve into the fundamental concept behind authentication in the first place. And let's start off with why we even need a password. Now, here's the deal. When you go to a website that has a username and a password, you know, for you to sign in on, really what's happening there? The idea is you're trying to identify yourself to the website. By entering your username, you are declaring that, hey, I am this person. Clearly, that's not enough to sign you in, right? Which is why they have a password. A password is a way for you to prove that you are indeed that person you claim to be. So the question then is, why does a password work as proof? The reason why this works is because it is a shared secret between you and the web service. So you can see why this is sort of a fair assumption that, you know, if I am sure that you are the only one who knows this piece of information and you can present it to me, it gives me some reassurance that you are who you claim to be. Of course, we know that in many cases this is not true and, well, we can see the problems of putting too much reliance on a password, especially if it's one that you generate. That is where multi-factor authentication actually comes into play. Having the password is one factor. And well, by using other different kinds of factors, we sort of get more and more solid proof that it is indeed you and not anyone else. So of course, the next question is what are these factors? Well, we've just already taken a look at one and that is known as what you know. The two other factors are what you have and what you are. So let's take a closer look at what these terms actually mean. What you have is pretty simple. And while this seems to be you know, a fairly new thing, in fact, this factor of authentication has been in use for many, many years now. You know how when you go to an ATM and you try to draw money, you're gonna have to put in your ATM card into the reader. That is in fact, a what you have kind of authentication. This is why losing your ATM pin isn't the end of the world. Losing your ATM pin doesn't mean someone's gonna be able to break into your bank account because you're gonna to need to supply the ATM card as well. Of course, if you lose both, then well, that's a problem. But the point is, these are two different factors. What you know, that is your pin, and what you have, that is your card. A more modern example of a what you have kind of situation is of course having a dongle like this one. This of course, when I press a button, it actually generates a little code and that is what I use to authenticate myself. If you don't have a dongle, you can still have an app on your phone that generates the code for you. And the value they generate is based on some kind of algorithm that is fed by some input that is unique to you. The idea is if I'm able to give the correct response, it proves that I have this device. And the whole idea is only I have this device. So, well, it's a way of proving that it's me. So now we've seen what you have as well as what you know. The third one is the interesting one, which is what you are. These actually boil down to something unique about, you know, a person. For example, an iris scan or a fingerprint scan. There really isn't very much to explain about this. I think it's fairly straightforward. The idea is there is something biologically about you that is hard to, you know, duplicate and yet can uniquely identify you. This makes a different factor other than you know what you have or what you know. 
I would say this is one of the sort of newer ways of authenticating a user, but it's getting more and more common now that we have fingerprint scanners on both phones and personal computers. So now that we've come so far, now that we've understood the general idea behind multi-factor authentication, let's compare a few different use cases and see whether one is more secure than the other. Now, if you've been paying attention when I was talking about the ATM card example, you realize that, well, going to an ATM to draw money, you only supply two pieces of information. That is, well, the card itself, as well as your PIN number. However, when it comes to signing in to say Facebook, where you enter a username, a password, and a security code, that seems to be more secure, right? Because I'm supplying three pieces of information. Well, as it turns out, no. Both of these are two-factor authentication methods. Let's delve deep at taking a look at why. Firstly, what's different between the two? Clearly, when you're actually, you know, trying to draw money from an ATM, you don't have to supply a username. The ATM card both identifies you as well as proves something under the what you have category. Your PIN is what you know. Therefore, there are two different factors here. You realize that when it comes to logging into Facebook, it's exactly the same. Your username and password may look like two different pieces of information, but ultimately, they both fall under the same umbrella of what you know. Therefore, even though we have two pieces of information here, it really only covers one factor, and therefore has the safety of basically one factor. The added factor comes from the code, which, well, depends on the fact that you have your phone and therefore falls under the what you have category. Therefore, from this point of view at least, the two are equivalent. They are both methods that involve two-factor authentication. For those of you who play games, you know, if you use Steam, you realize that now when you're trying to sell your trading cards, you're gonna actually have to go over to your phone and confirm it. What this means is if someone has hacked your account and tries to you know, sell away your precious items, well, if they don't have your phone, they cannot do it. Therefore, this is two-factor authentication, right? You need what you know to sign in as well as what you have, that is your phone. However, there is actually a small problem with this. I can actually sell cards from my phone itself and then authenticate it using the same device. That is one key prerequisite of the what you have part. If the thing you have is not separate from the thing you use to key in the what you know information, it defeats the purpose entirely. I hope you can see why this is a problem. You know, if someone wants to sell your cards and they pick up your phone, well, they can do it anyway. There is no separate factor of authentication. Of course, I'm not saying the way Steam does things isn't secure, Clearly, there is a loophole there, but well, it does sort of mitigate the risk because that malicious entity still needs access to your physical phone in order to do this. A similar example is, say I'm trying to log in to some service, they send a message to my phone, and because my phone has some kind of notification mirroring service, eventually the code gets mirrored to my computer. Again, I hope you can see why this is a problem here. You now no longer strictly need to have my phone, in order to actually log in, and that creates a point of failure. So then what is the best way to stay safe? Obviously, to use all three factors at once. It would be really cool if, you know, you went to an ATM and you put in your card, you entered your PIN, and you had to scan your fingerprint. That of course makes things even safer, because now you probably have to be physically there in order to draw money. So yeah, just a few examples of when multi-factor authentication works and doesn't work. Hopefully this paints, you know, an in-depth and clear picture about how the whole idea behind multi-factor authentication actually operates. But yeah, that basically wraps it up for this particular episode. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.